While our townspeople were trying to come to terms with their sudden isolation, the plague was posting sentries at the gates and turning away ships bound for the town. No vehicle had entered the town since the gates were closed. From that day onwards, one had the impression that all cars were moving in circles. The harbour too presented a strange appearance to those who looked down on it from the top of the boulevards. The commercial activity that hitherto made it one of the chief ports on the coast had ceased abruptly. Only a few ships detained in quarantine were anchored in the bay. But the gaunt, idle cranes on the wharfs, tip carts lying on their sides, neglected heaps of sacks and barrels, all testified that commerce too had died of plague. In spite of such unusual sights, our townsfolk apparently found it hard to grasp what was happening to them. There were feelings all could share, such as fear and separation, but personal interests too continued to occupy the foreground of their thoughts. Nobody as yet had really acknowledged to himself what the disease connoted. Most people were chiefly aware of what ruffled the normal tenor of their lives or affected their interests. They were worried and irritated. But these are not feelings with which to confront plague. Their first reaction, for instance, was to abuse the authorities. The prefects repost to criticism echoed by the press. Could not the regulations be modified and made less stringent? Was somewhat unexpected. Hitherto neither the newspapers nor the Ransdok Information Bureau had been given any official statistics relating to the academic. Now the prefects supplied them daily to the Bureau, with the request that they should be broadcast once a week. In this too, the reaction of the public was slower than might have been expected. Thus the bare statement that 302 deaths had taken place in the third week of plague failed to strike their imagination. For one thing, all the 302 deaths might not have been due to plague. Also, no one in the town had any idea of the average weekly death rate in ordinary times. The population of the town was about 200,000. There was no knowing if the present death rate were really so abnormal. This is, in fact, the kind of statistics that nobody ever troubles much about, notwithstanding that its interest is obvious. The public lacked, in short, standards of comparison. It was only as time passed and the steady rise in the death rate could not be ignored that public opinion became alive to the truth. For in the fifth week there were 321 deaths and 345 in the sixth. These figures anyhow spoke for themselves, yet they were still not sensational enough to prevent our townsfolk, perturbed though they were, from persisting in the idea that what was happening was a sort of accident, disagreeable enough, but certainly of a temporary order. So they went on strolling about the town as usual, and sitting at the tables of cafe terraces. Generally speaking, they did not lack courage, bandied more jokes than lamentations, and made a show of accepting cheerfully unpleasantness that obviously could only be passing. In short, they kept up appearances. However, toward the end of the month, about the time of the week of prayer, which will be described later on, there were more serious developments, altering the whole aspect of the town. To begin with, the prefect took measures controlling the traffic and food supply. Gasoline was rationed and restrictions were placed on the sale of foodstuffs. Reductions were ordered in the use of electricity. Only necessaries were bought by road or air. Thus the traffic thinned out progressively until hardly any private cars were on the roads. Luxury shops closed overnight and others began to put up sold out notices while crowds of buyers stood waiting at the doors. Our town assumed a novel appearance. You saw more pedestrians, and in the slack hours, numbers of people, reduced to idleness because shops and a good many offices were closed, crowded the streets and cafes. For the present they were not unemployed, merely on holiday. So it was that on fine days, towards three in the afternoon, the town brought to mind a city where public rejoicings are in progress. Shops are shut and traffic is stopped to give a merry-making populace the freedom of the streets. Naturally, the picture houses benefited by the situation and made money hand over fist. They had one difficulty, however, to provide a change of programme, since the circulation of films in the region had been suspended. After a fortnight, the various cinemas were obliged to exchange films, and after a further lapse of time, to show always the same programme. In spite of this, their takings did not fall off. 
the cafes thanks to the big stocks accumulated in a town where wine and liquor trade holds pride of place were equally able to cater for their patrons and to tell the truth there was much heavy drinking. One of the cafes had the brilliant idea of putting up a slogan the best protection against infection is a bottle of good wine which confirmed an already prevalent opinion that alcohol is a safeguard against infectious disease. Every night, around 2am, quite a number of drunken men ejected from the cafe staggered down the streets vociferating optimism. Yet all these changes were, in one sense, so fantastic and had been made so precipitately that it wasn't easy to regard them as likely to have any permanence, with the result that we went on focusing our attention on our personal feelings. When leaving the hospital two days after the gates were closed, Dr. Rieu met Cotard in the street. The little man was beaming with satisfaction. Rieu congratulated him on his appearance. Yes, Cotard said, I'm feeling very fit. Never was fitter in my life. But tell me, Doctor, this blasted plague, what about it? Getting to look mighty serious, isn't it? When the doctor nodded, he continued exuberantly, and there's no reason for it to stop now. This town's going to be an unholy mess by the looks of things. They walked a little way together. Cotard told the story of a grocer in his street who had laid by masses of canned provisions with the idea of selling them later on at a big profit. When the ambulance men came to fetch him, he had several dozen cans of meat under his bed. He died in the hospital. There's no money in plague, that's sure. Cotard was a mine of stories of this kind, true or false about the epidemic. One of them was about a man with all the symptoms and running a high fever who dashed out into the street, flung himself on the first woman he met and embraced her, yelling that he'd got it. Good for him, was Cotard's comment. But his next remark seemed to belie his gleeful ex exclamation. Anyhow, we'll all be nuts before long unless I'm much mistaken. It was on the afternoon of the same day that Grand at last unburdened himself to Rio. Noticing Madame Rue's photograph on the desk, he looked at the doctor inquiringly. Rue told him that his wife was under treatment in a sanatorium some distance from the town. In one way, Grant said, that's lucky. The doctor agreed that it was lucky, in a sense, but he added the great thing was that his wife should recover. Yes, Grant said, I understand. And then for the first time since Rue had made his acquaintance, he became quite voluble. Though he still had trouble over his words, he succeeded nearly always in finding them. Indeed, it was as if for years he'd been thinking over what he now said. When in his teens, he had married a very young girl, one of a poor family living nearby. It was, in fact, in order to marry that he'd abandoned his studies and taken up his present job. Neither he nor Jean ever stirred from their part of the town. In his courting days, he used to go and see her at her home, and the family were inclined to make fun of her bashful, silent admirer. Her father was a railroad man. When off duty, he spent most of the time seated in a corner beside the window, gazing meditatively at passers-by, his enormous hands splayed out on his thighs. His wife was always busy with domestic duties, in which Jean gave her a hand. Jean was so tiny that it always made Grand nervous to see her crossing a street. The vehicles bearing down on her looked so gigantic. Then one day, shortly before Christmas, they went out for a short walk together and stopped to admire a gaily decorated shop window. After gazing ecstatically at it for some moments, Jean turned to him. Oh, isn't it lovely? He squeezed her wrist. It was thus that the marriage had come about. The rest of the story, to Grant's thinking, was very simple. The common lot of married couples. You get married. You go on loving a bit longer. You work and you work so hard that it makes you forget to love. As the head of the office where Grand was employed hadn't kept his promise, Jean too had to work outside. At this point, a little imagination was needed to grasp what Grand was trying to convey. Owing largely to fatigue, he gradually lost grip of himself, had less and less to say, and failed to keep alive the feeling in his wife that she was loved. An overworked husband, poverty, the gradual loss of hope in a better future silent evenings at home. What chance had any passion of surviving such conditions? Probably Jean had suffered, and yet she'd stayed. Of course, one may often suffer a long time without knowing it. Thus years went by. Then one day, she left him.
Naturally, she hadn't gone alone. I was very fond of you, but now I'm so tired. I'm not happy to go, but one needn't be happy to make another start. That, more or less, was what she said in her letter. Grant too had suffered, and he too might, as Rio pointed out, have made a fresh start. But no, he'd lost faith. Only he couldn't stop thinking about her. What he'd have liked to do was to write her a letter justifying himself. But it, it, it's not so easy, he told Rhea. I've been thinking it over for years. While we loved each other, we didn't need words to make ourselves understood. But people don't love forever. A time came when I should have found the words to keep her with me. Only I couldn't. Graham produced something from his pocket that looked like a check duster and blew his nose noisily. Then he wiped his moustache. Rhea gazed at him in silence. F forgive me, Doctor, Grand added hastily, but how shall I put it? I, I, I feel you're to be trusted, that, that, that I can talk to you about these things. And then, you see, I get all worked up. Obviously, Grand's thoughts were leagues away from the plague. That evening, Rhea sent a telegram to his wife telling her that the town was closed, that she must go on taking great care of herself, and that she was in his thoughts. One evening, when he was leaving the hospital, it was about three weeks after the closing of the gates, Rhea found a young man waiting for him in the street. Oh, you remember me, don't you? Rhea believed he did, but couldn't quite place him. I, I called on you just before this trouble started, the young man said, for information about the living conditions in the a Arab quarter. My name's Raymond Rombauer. Ah, ah, yes, of course. Well, you've now the makings of a good story for your paper. Rumbear, who gave the impression of being much less self-assured than he had seemed on the first occasion when they met, said it wasn't what he'd come about. He wanted to know if the doctor would kindly give him some help. I must apologise, he continued, but really I don't know a soul here, and the local representative of my paper is a complete dud. Rear said he had to go to a dispensary in the centre of town, and suggested they should walk there together. Their way lay through the narrow streets of the Negro district. Evening was coming on. But the town, once so noisy at this hour, was strangely still. The only sounds were some bugle calls echoing through the air, still golden with the end of daylight. The army, anyhow, was making a show of carrying on as usual. Meanwhile, as they walked down the steep little streets flanked by blue, mauve and saffron yellow walls, Rumber talked incessantly, as if his nerves were out of hand. He had left his wife in Paris, he said. Well, she wasn't actually his wife, but it came to the same thing. The moment the town was put into quarantine, he'd sent her a wire. His impression then was that this state of things was quite temporary, and all he'd tried to do was to get a letter through to her. But the post office officials had vetoed this. His colleagues of the local press said they could do nothing for him, and the clerk in the prefect's office had laughed in his face. It was only after waiting in line for a couple of hours that he'd managed to get a telegram accepted. All goes well, hope to see you soon. But next morning, when he woke up, it had dawned on him that after all there was absolutely no knowing how long this business was going to last, so he decided to leave the town at once. Being able, thanks to his professional status, to pull some strings, he'd secured an interview with a high official in the prefect's office. He'd explained that his presence in the town was purely accidental, he had no connection with the town, and uh, no reason for staying in it. That being so, he surely was entitled to leave, even if once outside the town he had to undergo a, sp a spell of quarantine. The official told him he quite appreciated his position, but no exceptions could be made. He would, however, see if anything could be done, though he could hold out little hope of a quick decision, as the authorities were taking a very serious view of the situation. But confound it, Rombe explained, I don't belong here. Quite so. Anyhow, let's hope the epidemic will soon be over. Finally, he had tried to console Rumbaugh by pointing out that as a journalist he had an excellent subject on his hands. Indeed, when one came to think of it, no event, however disagreeable in some ways, but had its bright side. Whereat Rumbaugh had shrugged his shoulders petulantly and walked out. They'd come to the centre of the town. It's too damn silly, Doctor, isn't it? The truth is I wasn't brought into the world to write newspaper articles, but it's quite likely I was brought into the world to live with a woman. That's reasonable enough, isn't it? Rhea replied cautiously that there might be something in what he said. The central boulevards were not so crowded as usual. The few people about were hurrying to distant homes. Not a smile was to be seen on any face. 
Rio suggested that this was a result of the latest Ransdock announcement. After 24 hours, our townspeople would begin to hope again, but on the days when they were announced, the statistics were too fresh in everybody's memory. The truth, Rombert remarked abruptly, is that she and I have been together only a short time, and we suit each other perfectly. When Rio said nothing, he continued, I can see I'm boring you. Sorry, uh, all I wanted was to know whether you couldn't possibly give me a certificate stating that I haven't got this damn disease. It might make things easier, I think. Rio nodded. A small boy had just run against his legs and fallen. He set him on his feet again. Walking on, they came to the Place d'Armes. Grey with dust, the palms and fig trees drooped despondently about the Statue of the Republic, which too was coated with grime and dust. They stopped beside the statue. Rio stamped his feet on the flagstones to shake off the coat of white dust that had gathered on them. His hat pushed slightly backwards, his shirt collar gaping under a loosely knotted tie, his cheeks ill-shaven. The journalist had the sulky, stubborn look of a young man who feels himself deeply injured. Please don't doubt I understand you, Rear said, but you must see your argument doesn't hold water. I can't give you that certificate because I don't know whether you have the disease or not, and even if I did, how could I certify that between the moment of leaving my consulting room and your arrival at the prefect's office, you wouldn't be infected? And even if I did? And even if you did? Even if I gave you a certificate, it wouldn't help. But why not? Because there are thousands of people placed as you are in this town, and there can't be any question of allowing them to leave it. Or even supposing they haven't got the plague? That's not a sufficient reason. Oh, I know it's an absurd situation, but we're all involved in it, and we've got to accept it as it is. But I don't belong here! Unfortunately from now, you'll belong here like everybody else. Rambo raised his voice a little. But damn it, Doctor! Can't you see it's a matter of common human feeling? Or don't you realise what this sort of separation means to people who are fond of each other? Rio was silent for a moment, then said he understood it perfectly. He wished nothing better that Rambo should be allowed to return to his wife, and that all who loved one another and were parted should come together again. Only the law was the law. Plague had broken out, and he could only do what had to be done. No! Rambert said bitterly. You can't understand. You're using the language of reason, not the heart. You live in a world of abstractions. The doctor glanced up at the Statue of the Republic, then said he didn't know if he was using the language of reason. But he knew he was using the language of the facts as everybody could see them, which wasn't necessarily the same thing. The journalist tugged at his tie to straighten it. So I take it I can't count on help from you. Very good. But his tone was challenging. Leave this town, I shall. The doctor repeated that he quite understood, but all that was none of his business. You excuse me, but it is your business, Rumbo raised his voice again. I approached you because I've been told you played a part in drawing up the orders that have been issued, so I thought that in one case anyway you could unmake what you'd helped to make. But you don't care. You never gave a thought to anybody. You didn't take the case of people who were separated into account. Rhea admitted this was true up to a point. He preferred not to take such cases into account. Ah, I see now. Rambert explained. You'll soon be talking about the interests of the general public, but public welfare is merely the sum total of the private welfares of each of us. The doctor seemed abruptly to come out of a dream. Oh, come, he said. There's that, but there's much more to it than that. It doesn't do to rush to conclusions, you know, but you've no reason to feel angered. I, I assure you that if you find a way out of your quandary, I shall be extremely pleased. Only there are things that my official position debars me from doing. Rambert tossed his head petulantly. Yes, yes, I was wrong to show annoyance, and I've taken up too much of your time already. Rhea asked him to let him know how he got on with his project, and not to bear him a grudge for not having been more amenable. He was sure, he added, that there was some common ground on which they could meet. Rambert looked perplexed. Then, yes, he said, after a short silence. I'd rather think so too, in spite of myself, and all you've just been saying. He paused. Still, I can't agree with you. Pulling down his hat over his eyes, he walked quickly away. Rio saw him enter the hotel where Taru was staying. After a moment, the doctor gave a slight nod, as if approving of some thought that had crossed his mind. Yes, the journalist was right in refusing to be balked of happiness. But was he right in reproaching him, Rio, with living in a world of abstractions, 
Could that term, abstraction, really apply to these days he spent in his hospital while the plague was battening on the town, raising its death toll to 500 victims a week? Yes, an element of abstraction, of a divorce from reality, entered into such calamities. Still, when abstraction sets to killing you, you've got to get busy with it. And so much Rhea knew that this wasn't the easiest course. Running this auxiliary hospital, for instance, of which he was in charge, there were now three such hospitals, was no light task. He had had an anteroom leading into his surgery installed, equipped for dealing with patients on arrival. The floor had been excavated and replaced by a shallow lake of water and chrysalic acid, in the centre of which was a sort of island made of bricks. The patient was carried to the island, rapidly undressed and his clothes dropped into the disinfectant water. After being washed, dried and dressed in one of the coarse hospital nightshirts, he was taken to Rhea for examination, then carried to one of the wards. This hospital, a requisition schoolhouse, now contained 500 beds, almost all of which were occupied. After the reception of the patients, which he personally supervised, Ryu injected serum, lanced bubos, checked the statistics again, and returned for his afternoon consultations. Only when night was settling in did he start on his round of visits, and never got home till a very late hour. On the previous night, his mother, when handing him a telegram from his wife, had remarked that his hands were shaking. Yes, he said, but it's only a matter of sticking to it, and my nerves will steady down. You'll see. He had a robust constitution, and as yet wasn't feeling really tired. Still, his visits, for one thing, were beginning to put a great strain on his endurance. Once the epidemic was diagnosed, the patient had to be evacuated forthwith. Then, indeed, began abstraction and a tussle with the family, who knew they would not see the sick man again until he was dead or cured. Have some pity, doctor. It was Madame Lorette, mother of the chambermaid at Taru's hotel, who made the appeal. An unnecessary appeal, of course, he had pity. But what purpose could it serve? He had to telephone, and soon the ambulance could be heard clanging down the street. At first the neighbours used to open windows and watch. Later they promptly shut them. Then came a second phase of conflict, tears and pleading, abstraction in a word. In those fever-hot, nerve-ridden sick rooms, crazy scenes took place. But the issue was always the same. The patient was removed, then Rhea too could leave. In the early days, he had merely telephoned, then rushed off to see other patients, without waiting for the ambulance. But no sooner was he gone than the family locked and barred their doors, preferring contact with the plague to a parting whose issue they now knew only too well. There followed objurgations, screams, batterings on the door, action by the police, and later armed force. The patient was taken by storm. Thus, during the first few weeks, Rio was compelled to stay with the patient till the ambulance came. Later, when each doctor was accompanied by a volunteer police officer, Rio could hurry away to the next patient. But to begin with, every evening was like that evening when he was called in for Madame Lorette's daughter. He was shown into a small apartment decorated with fans and artificial flowers. The mother greeted him with a faltering smile. Well, I do hope it's not the fever everyone's talking about. Lifting the coverlet and chemise, he gazed in silence at the red blotches on the girl's thighs and stomach, the swollen ganglia. After one glance, the mother broke into shrill, uncontrollable cries of grief. And every evening, mothers wailed thus, with a distraught abstraction, as their eyes fell on those fatal stigmata on limbs and bellies. Every evening, hands gripped Rhea's arms, where there was a rush of useless words, promises and tears. Every evening, the nearing toxin of the ambulance provoked scenes as vain as every form of grief. Rhea had nothing to look forward to but a long sequence of such scenes, renewed again and again. Yes, plague, like abstraction, was monotonous. Perhaps only one factor changed, and that was Rhea himself. Standing at the foot of the Statue of the Republic that evening, he felt it. All he was conscious of was a bleak indifference, steadily gaining on him, as he gazed at the door of the hotel Rumbert had just entered. After these wearing weeks, after all these nightfalls, when the townsfolk poured into the streets to roam them aimlessly, Rhea had learned that he need no longer steel himself against pity. 
one grows out of pity when it's useless. And in this feeling that his heart had slowly closed in on himself, the doctor found a solace, his only solace, for the utmost unendurable burden of his days. This he knew would make his task easier. And therefore he was glad of it. When he came home at two in the morning and his mother was shocked at the blank look he gave her, she was deploring precisely the sole alleviation Rhea could then experience. To fight abstraction, you must have something of it in your own makeup. But how could Rombert be expected to grasp that? Abstraction for him was all that stood in the way of his happiness. Indeed, Rio had to admit the journalist was right in one sense. But he knew too that abstraction sometimes proved itself stronger than happiness. And then, if only then, it has to be taken into account. And this was what was going to happen to Rombert. As the doctor was to learn when, much later, Rombert told him more about himself. Thus he was unable to follow, and on a different plane, the dreary struggle in progress between each man's happiness and the abstractions of the plague, which constituted the whole life of our town over a long period of time.